Ever catch yourself wondering how some people just seem to absolutely CRU as shit at work? Yeah, like they've got some secret recipe for success. Right. Well, get ready to take some notes because today's deep dive is all about unlocking that secret sauce. And the best part is it's not about some magical talent or, you know, uh, luck. We're diving into a method called modeling mastery performance that's all about really breaking down the specific elements that drive high performance. And it's way more practical than it sounds. You are absolutely. This isn't some theoretical mumbo jumbo. Right. This model has been used over a thousand times a thousand. Wow by Fortune 500 companies. I mean, mm -hmm. when you see those kinds of numbers, you know it's got to be more than just a fad. Absolutely. And what's really cool about this model is that it's based on, you know, real-world observation, analysis of actual top performers. Think of it like this. Instead of just guessing what makes someone successful, this method actually zooms in on the people who are already knocking it out of the park and figures out what they're doing differently. So whether you are gunning for that promotion, prepping for a big presentation, or just want to you know, level up your game at work, this episode is like a masterclass in pinpointing exactly what to focus on for maximum impact. Yeah. And trust me, after this deep dive, you'll start seeing your own work through a whole new lens. Exactly. It's about figuring out what separates the masters from the rest of us and then using those insights to unlock your own potential. Okay, so let's unpack how this modeling mastery performance thing actually works. Imagine you're a detective at a crime scene, right? But instead of looking for clues about a crime, you're on the hunt for the secrets of success. Okay, I like where you're going with this. So the first step is to identify what the chapter calls areas of performance or AOPs. These are like the key missions of a job, the essential things someone needs to do to be successful in their role. Think of it like a to-do list. Yes. For peak performance. Exactly. And to make this super relatable, the chapter uses the example of a store manager, which I thought was brilliant because, let's be honest, we've all had some kind of experience with a store manager, good or bad. Right, right. And figure 11.4 lays out some of those core AOPs for a store manager. Things like staff training, customer service, inventory management. It's a great way to visualize how this model breaks down a job into its essential components. It makes total sense. So you've got your AOPs, your key missions, What's the next step in our detective work? Well, for each of those AOPs, you have to kind of dig deeper. Put on the magnifying glass. Yeah, this is where we put on our magnifying glasses, you and I, and really get into the nitty gritty. We're talking about getting crystal clear on the specific outputs or results that are expected for each AOP. Okay. How are those outputs measured? What are the exact tasks and activities that go into achieving those outputs? So it's kind of like reverse engineering success, right? Yeah. You start with the desired outcome and you work backward, figuring out all the individual steps and ingredients that go into making it happen. Precisely. And here's where it gets really interesting. This model doesn't just stop at describing the ideal scenario. Uh -huh. It forces you to compare that ideal to the reality on the ground. Ooh, I see where you're going with this. Uh -huh. We're talking about identifying those pesky gaps between what should be happening yes. and what's actually happening. Exactly. The chapter calls this the gap analysis. Okay. And it's where we start to get some real aha moments. Are deadlines consistently being missed? Are sales targets not being met? Why are those things happening? This is where we ask those tough questions and try to figure out the root causes behind those performance gaps. All right, so let's say we've identified some of these performance gaps. What's the next step in our detective work? How do we actually start bridging the gap between what's happening and what should be happening? Yeah. So we've identified those gaps, those places where performance isn't quite matching up to the ideal. Now what? Mm -hmm. How do we actually close those gaps and, you know, help people reach their full potential? This is where things get really interesting to me. Yeah, you're right. This is where the model goes from like diagnosis to action, right? Mm -hmm. So once you know where the gaps are, you can start figuring out why those gaps exist. And that's when you can start pinpointing the enablers. Okay. The specific things that need to be in place for people to not just perform, but to truly excel, to reach mastery. Okay, hold on. Back up a sec. Enablers. Yeah. It's one of those words that sounds kind of jargony at first. What are we really talking about here? It's actually very intuitive when you think about it. Imagine a musician trying to play, you know, a beautiful piece on a piano that's completely out of tune. No matter how skilled the musician, the performance is going to suffer because their instrument, their enabler, is lacking. The same goes for people in the workplace. Ooh, I like that analogy. Yeah. So enablers are basically like 
the tools, the resources, the support systems that people need to perform at their best. Like you can't expect someone to bake a cake without flour, eggs, and oven. Right. Exactly. And just like a master baker needs high quality ingredients in a fully functioning kitchen, people in the workplace need the right ingredients and the right environment to thrive. Okay, this is making a lot more sense now. So what are some examples of these enablers? Well, the chapter breaks it down into two main categories, human assets and environmental assets. Okay. Sounds pretty self-explanatory. Yeah. Human assets, those are the things that are inherent to the individual, right? Like their skills, their knowledge. You got it. Think of human assets as the toolbox that each person brings to the job. Are they proficient in the necessary software? Do they have the right communication skills, problem-solving skills? Those are their human assets. Figure 11.3 in the chapter actually provides a really comprehensive checklist of human assets to consider. It's like a cheat sheet for building a high-performing team. Okay, so that's the human asset side of things. Mm -hmm. What about those environmental assets? This is where it gets really strategic and honestly kind of fascinating. Yes. Environmental assets encompass everything outside the individual that can impact performance. We're talking about the systems, the processes, even the cultural norms that either support or hinder people's ability to do their best work. So if human assets are the individual ingredients for success, then environmental assets are like the recipe, the kitchen, maybe even the head chef who's, you know, providing guidance and inspiration. I love that analogy. And just like a recipe can make or break a dish, those environmental assets can make or break someone's ability to excel. Think about things like access to information. Do people have the data they need to make good decisions? Are workflows clear and efficient, or are people constantly bogged down by unnecessary bureaucracy? Does the company culture encourage collaboration and innovation, or does it you know, stifle creativity and risk taking? Okay, yeah, I can see how those environmental assets could make a huge difference, but honestly, sometimes those things can be hard to change, right? Like we can't just snap our fingers and create a perfect company culture overnight. You're right, changing those you know, really deep rooted systems and cultural norms takes time and effort. But that's where this modeling mastery performance method gets really powerful. Instead of relying on some outside consultant who doesn't really understand the nuances of your organization, this model encourages you to tap into the wisdom and experience of the people who are already excelling within your company. So instead of trying to reinvent the wheel, you're basically saying, hey, let's learn from the people who are already driving the bus. Exactly. And who better to identify those crucial enablers than the people who are already performing at a mastery level? The chapter even recommends assembling a team of your top performers, your master performers, if you will, to help guide the process. That makes a lot of sense. They're the ones who are already living and breathing it every day, so they probably have the best insights into what's working, what's not, what needs to change. But what's the benefit of having them be a part of the process? Two big reasons, actually. First, you're getting much more accurate, more nuanced insights because you're hearing directly from the people in the trenches, the ones who are actually doing the work day in and day out. Okay. They're the ones who know firsthand what it takes to excel in that specific environment. So you're not just getting some, you know, generic one size fits all solution. You're getting tailored insights based on real world experience within your own company. I like it. What's the second reason? The second reason is all about buy in. When people feel like they've been heard, like their voices and experiences have been valued, they're much more likely to get on board with any changes that come out of the process. It's about creating a sense of ownership, shared responsibility for improvement. Makes sense. People are much more likely to support something they helped create. Yeah. Right. So we've identified the performance mm -hmm. gaps. We've pinpointed the enablers. We've even assembled a crack team of our very own master performers. What happens next? How do we actually start implementing these changes and seeing some real results? So we've laid out the framework. We've got our team of master performers. They're ready to roll up their sleeves. But it's not all just talk, right? This model is supposed to drive real, tangible change within an organization. Yeah, this isn't some, you know, feel good exercise. It's about translating those insights from your master performers into action. The chapter gives some really compelling examples of how this model has been used to transform everything from hiring practices to training programs to get this, even the physical design of workspaces. OK, so paint me a picture here. Yeah. How does this actually play out in the real world? Yeah. Let's say we're using this model to, I don't know, improve our sales team's performance. What might that look like in action? 
Okay, so let's say one of the key areas of performance for your sales team is lead qualification, right? Making sure that they're spending their time on, you know, the most promising prospect. Makes sense. So you gather your top performing salespeople and using the model, you uncover this critical enabler, access to real-time customer data. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. If your salespeople are working with, like, outdated information, they're kind of flying blind. Exactly. They're wasting time chasing dead-end leads or missing opportunities because they don't have a clear picture of what the customer's needs are. Right. So based on this insight, you invest in a new customer relationship management system, a CRM system okay. that gives your sales team real-time visibility into customer interactions, buying history, you name it. Ah, so it's not just about identifying the problem. It's about using those insights to make targeted strategic investments in the things that will actually move the needle. Precisely. And the beauty of this model is that it can be applied to so many different facets of an organization, right? Yeah. Maybe you discover that your marketing team is consistently missing deadlines because the approval process is super clunky and convoluted. Uh -huh. Or perhaps your customer service reps are getting burned out because they're lacking opportunities for professional development. By identifying those gaps and pinpointing those enablers, you can create a roadmap for creating a more effective, more engaged, and ultimately more successful organization. It's like taking a magnifying glass to your company, right? Yeah. Zooming in on all those little things that can either accelerate performance or, or hinder it. Absolutely. I'm already feeling inspired to start implementing this in my own work. Which, speaking of, I think that's a perfect segue to our final thought for our listeners today. Yes, please. So we've covered a lot of ground today. But at the end of the day, the real power of this modeling mastery performance framework, it lies in its application. So here's a challenge for everyone listening. Think of a goal you're currently working towards, something you're really striving to achieve in your professional life. Ooh, I like it. Now put on your modeling mastery performance hat. Break that goal down into its key areas of performance. What are the essential things you need to be doing to achieve that goal? Where are your potential gaps, those areas where you're consistently falling short or feeling stuck? And finally, what enablers could help you bridge those gaps? Are there certain skills you need to develop, resources you need to acquire, support systems you need to put in place? Yeah, it's like we're giving our listeners a whole new toolkit for achieving their goals. The chapter provides the framework, but the real magic happens when you start applying it to your own life and work. Exactly. And who knows? You might just uncover the hidden enablers that unlock your own personal version mastery. And on that note, we'll leave you with that food for thought. Thanks for joining us for this deep dive. We'll catch you next time.